title of my message today is How's Your Faith? How's Your Faith? We see here Jesus interacting with a group of Jews uh, that are having a hard time believing that he is equal with the Father. They're having a hard time believing that he is the Messiah. And so he calls on four different witnesses to testify about who he is. So let's read this passage, and then we'll pray, and we'll come back and take a closer look at it. So beginning in verse 31 of John chapter 5, Jesus says, If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it to you that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the very work that the Father has given me to finish, and which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You diligently study the scriptures, because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept praise from men, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another, yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God? But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is living and active, that it's sharp, that it's powerful, that it can judge our thoughts, can judge our emotions, our attitudes. And Lord, I pray as we come to this portion of scripture today, that we would approach it with humility Uh, with reverence, with awe. Lord, that we would allow your Holy Spirit to be very introspective and to look, allowing us to be introspective rather, and, and for us to look into our lives, into our hearts, and just ask you, Lord, what do you have for me today? What do you want me to, to say? What do you want me to think? What do you want me to do, Lord, because of your word? Lord, may that always be the posture of our heart, Lord, that we would be humble and that we would grow, that we'd become closer and closer to you with each passing day, Lord, with each time in your word. Lord, we lift up our country to you. We pray that uh, you would heal our president, Father. Lord, we pray that you would um, uh, just allow the results of the election to continue to uh, enable us to live in a country where we can exercise freedom, where we can gather and assemble, Lord, for the gospel's sake, where we can share with others and talk about things freely, Lord. Father, we love you. We want to love you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible does not make much effort to hide the faults of its heroes. The Bible does not try to gloss over the failures of the the people who are the themes of the stories that we read here in God's Word. Two of the greatest heroes of the Jewish faith are Abraham and Moses. Abraham's story is found in Genesis chapter 12 and following following several chapters, and he's often referred to as the father of faith. But if you look carefully, if you look closely, you'll notice that Abraham, well, he had a couple lapses of faith. He had a couple experiences where I don't know if I'd call him the father of faith because he seemed to struggle. He seemed to get himself into some situations that a man of faith necessarily wouldn't get himself into. 
And what about Moses, the great lawgiver, the one who's even mentioned in our passage today? Well, Moses as well, although called by God, had some faith lapses, had some faults, had some failures in his life. The fact that the Bible does not gloss over the weaknesses, sins, inadequacies, lapses of faith in its heroes should be cause for great joy in your heart and in your life. Because the Bible, we read about real people. And if you're honest, and I hope you are, if I'm honest, it's easy to admit, uh, clear to see that you and I have lapses of faith. From time to time, we'll stop believing, maybe just for a little bit. We'll doubt whether God's going to come through. We'll, we'll struggle and wonder, and, and hopefully that doesn't last too long. But in our passage today, we see these four witnesses that Jesus brings. And as we look at each of these witnesses, I believe it's going to give us a reason and a method, if you will, to help us in these times of faith lapses, in these times where we may struggle and wonder, uh, we can look at each one of these witnesses and say, yeah, Jesus is real. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus did work in my life. Yes, he did. He did change me, and, and God is, is on the move. And so uh, you'll, you'll see that our passage here begins in verse 31, where Jesus just simply says, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. And you might think, well, wait a minute, this is the Son of God, no matter, everything he says is valid. I mean, he is, if whatever he says, whether it's about you or about himself, is going to be true. But in this particular culture, as in our culture, uh, if you're testifying about yourself, your testimony is not going to be very valid. If you're in a court of law and you stand up and you share how impeccable your character is and how awesome you are, um, and it may be true, uh, but that certainly is not going to carry the weight as if you bring four other character witnesses and they testify about your impeccable character and your degree of awesome. Now, um, in fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6, and this is the Jewish law, it says, On the testimony of two or three witnesses, a man shall be put to death, but no one shall be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. So obviously I'm pulling that one sentence out of, out of the law. Obviously there's, there's an infraction. Somebody does something that's, that's worth the death penalty. And here God's law says, well, if one person saw it, that's not good enough. There has to be at least two, better yet, three witnesses. And the Jewish writing of the Mishnah uh, says this, a man is not worthy of belief when he's speaking about himself. Or actually maybe it says a man is not worthy of belief when he tweets about himself or when he posts something on Facebook about himself. Or a man is not worthy of belief when he posts a picture of himself on Instagram. No, it doesn't say that. So, but then Demosthenes, the great, and I'm quoting from the Mishnah now. The Mishnah doesn't say anything about Twitter or Facebook, but Demosthenes, the great Greek orator, laid it down as a principle of justice. The laws do not allow a man to give evidence on his own behalf. So Jesus says, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. Well, what has his testimony been up to this point? Well, if you go back and look at the previous 10 or 20 verses, you'll see that Jesus is talking about the fact that he's equal with God. He's talking about the fact that he is the Messiah. He's the son of man. He's the one who came to save the world. And, uh, and so it's almost as if he's saying, if you're not going to believe me, let me bring some people. Let me call some witnesses. And so who's the first witness that he calls? He says in verse 32, um, he says, okay, there's another. I'm going to introduce now another witness to you. And then in verse 33, we find out that it is John the Baptist, or who I'm calling the forerunner. And so with each of these witnesses, I, wanna, I want to, for us to think about, okay, if I'm, if I'm struggling in my faith, if I'm having a lapse of faith, if, if maybe I'm not really, I'm, I'm struggling with believing that God's working in my heart, that, that Jesus still loves me. You know, sometimes when you fall into sin, you can think, man, God doesn't love me anymore. Look how lousy I am. In those moments, uh, look to the forerunner. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, here in our passage, the context here in the passage is uh, John the Baptist. 
Of course, you know John. John the Baptist was out in the desert preaching a baptism for the repentance of sins. Uh, He's out there calling people to repent of their sin, and he's baptizing them. Uh, Now, there had been, between the end of the Old Testament and John the Baptist, there's been 400 years that there's been no prophet, no prophet on the scene. And, and uh, uh, Judea, Israel, they're, they're, just, they're just ready for somebody to come and release them from the power of Rome over them. They're ready for a Messiah. They're ready to, to, uh, to have their independence. And so John the Baptist is out in the desert, and people are wondering, could this be the man? We finally, there's a prophet now. We finally have, we finally have a Messiah. But his was a ministry of preparation. His was a ministry of pointing people to Jesus. In fact, his message is very clear. John chapter 1, verse 29, uh, John said when he saw Jesus, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So John is saying, hey, everybody's looking at him, and he's saying, look over there. Look at Jesus. And then Jesus here tells us about John the Baptist. He says, what he was saying is true. (laughs) What was he saying? I'm the Lamb of God. I take away the sin of the world. And so Jesus says here that his testimony is valid in verse 32. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus takes away our sin? And that's good news. That's really good news. Um, and, And he said that John was a lamp, he says in verse 35. And in verse 34, he mentioned that I'm I'm telling you this so that you'll be saved, so that your sin can be taken away. John John was a lamp illuminating. Uh, We came home, we were at some people's house last night, and on the drive back home, it was very dark. They live a bit out of town, and and as we're driving home, it's really, really dark. And, And you need light to see where you're going. And John was this light illuminating a spiritual need for people that people had. So I say all of that um, to say, what was the forerunner in your life? Here's what I mean. Uh, Many, if not most, if not all of you are saved. You love Jesus. Some of you maybe have been saved recently. Maybe some of you have been saved for 20, 30, 40 years. But if you can, think back to that, the, the, the day, week, month, season in your life when you gave your life to the Lord. Now, there was a forerunner. And what I mean by that is that there was somebody preparing the way. It could have been, like it was for me, Christian concerts. I got invited to some different concerts, and I would go to these concerts, and the Lord used that to just ignite, to illuminate something, I, my spiritual need. And with you, maybe it was a friend that just kept talking to you about the Bible. Maybe it was a teacher or a coach. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was something you were watching on TV or, or in the media or the internet, something that was, was preparing your heart, your forerunner. And so in your moment of doubt, when your faith wanes, you can look back and say, oh, if I remember that forerunner in my life, God, God was doing something. He may be silent now, or maybe I can't really sense his presence now, but if I think back, he did something to Bring me to Jesus. This was very helpful for me when I was struggling as a young man with, uh, uh, you know, I was reading propaganda of, you know, we are the true church. There was some uh, cult was putting out this information and, and I'd read it and it makes sense. You know, citing all the scriptures and saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'd struggle like, well, maybe maybe I'm really not part of the true church and maybe I should... And I was struggling, but then I'd think back to my forerunner. I'd think about, oh, wait a minute. But when I was at that event, man, God showed me he was real. (laughs) When I was going through that situation, before I came to know the Lord, God was putting all this together so that I could get to this point. So the first witness sits down, and Jesus calls his second witness. What's his second witness? He says, well, he says that the second witness is weightier than that of John, that it's it's more substantial, it's more powerful. It's a greater testimony, he says in verse 36. And here's the second witness, the works of Jesus, for the very work that the Father has given me to finish. So this is the second witness. Now, what is is the work of Jesus? Well, in short, it's the miracles. It's the miracles that Jesus has done. In fact, when John's disciples were struggling 
Um, or actually, I, I guess John was struggling uh, because he wasn't seeing Jesus rise to power in the way he thought Jesus should rise to power. So he told his disciples, go ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that's going to, to set us free or should we look for another? And so these disciples come to Jesus and, and, uh, and here's Jesus' response. Matthew chapter 11, verse 4, Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, those with skin diseases are healed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. So what does Jesus point to? He points to his works. He's done these things. Because he's done these things, his, uh, he really is the savior of the world. Well, there's another work, another miracle that Jesus has done. And, uh, and you see that miracle every morning when you look in the mirror. Because God has done a work in your life and in your heart, if you're a Christian here today, a work of salvation, which is the greatest miracle. Don't ever, uh, don't ever think less that this is, that, you know, your salvation, your testimony is not uh, any more significant than anybody else's. Uh, he's changed your life. I mean, there are football games on TV right now, and you are here at church. God bless you. I know you're all thinking you've got, you're recording everything at home, right? You're going <laughs> to watch it this afternoon. That's okay. I am too. But here's, here's the thing. Um, Jesus says here in verse 36 that the work that the Father has given me to finish, it's work of salvation, you are a work that the Father gave Jesus to finish. And if you look around, you see all of these other works. There's people watching online right now. They are works. They are miracles. They are salvation miracles. And so when you struggle with wondering about the truth, you struggle with your life, you think God's forgotten you, you, you look back and you say, well, I wish I would have done all of this differently. Look at where I am now, and if only I would have done this, if only I would have done that. And, and you're starting to get a little down on yourself, and you're starting to give up and just think, you know, I'm, I, it's just, you know, God's not as awesome as he used to be or as I thought he would. Listen, listen, listen. When that happens, when your faith wanes, Look at the works that Jesus has done and think about his miracles. Think about the resurrection, but also think about your own salvation. Think about your salvation. God saved you. And I've talked to a few of you and I know God saved you <laughs> from some pretty ugly stuff. And you're here and you're saved and you're blessed. So that's two witnesses. So now Jesus calls to the witness stand his own father. Look at verse 37. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. So he calls to the witness stand his Father. Now, how does the Father testify about Jesus? Well, I think a, a couple ways. Uh, first of all, um, we know it's not recorded in John's gospel, but it is recorded in the gospel of Matthew that when Jesus was baptized in, um, let's see here, Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus was baptized. As soon as, in verse 16, 316, it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. I wonder what that looked like. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And then take note of this. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The testimony of the Father. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. I think secondarily we could say that the Father testifies about uh, Jesus and the fact that salvation was his plan. It's the plan of God. It was his idea. Also, we could look to uh, general revelation in the way of creation. 
uh, God's creation and the conviction that people feel in their heart about something's wrong, something needs to change in their heart and in their life. That's, that's a, I think, a, a general revelation that God, that God gives to people that eventually, uh, if they respond properly to it, will point them and bring them uh, to the cross. And so that's the third witness. You can remember that, that, that the Father uh, testifies uh, to Jesus. And you know, you can also, we mentioned Jesus' baptism. You can also look back at your baptism. Uh, hopefully we'll be having a baptism service here before too long, but, but uh, your baptism is a, uh, a beautiful time of uh, outward expression signifying an inward change, right? Ba- that's what baptism is. Um, the old has gone, the new has come. Baptism, you're going under the water, that's death. It's almost as if we're digging a hole, putting you in it, and then resurrection is coming up out of the water. That's life. So that's what baptism is. You're dying to yourself, and you're raised a new creature, a new creation. And, and think about that. You know, think about that, that that's, that's um, uh, you know, when you're struggling and, and you're wondering, you can just stop and think, man, I was baptized. I was baptized. I'm a, I'm a new creation. Um, belief in Jesus. And, and these Jews, unfortunately, uh, Jesus tells tells them, and, and he's being very honest and very open and very forthright with them. They say, you haven't heard the voice of my father. You haven't seen his form. His word doesn't dwell in you. You don't believe. You don't believe in the one he sent. In other words, you don't believe in Jesus. Well, belief in Jesus is the key to understanding all of life. It's certainly the key to experiencing God in your life. I have a, a good friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, who pastors out in North Carolina, and, and um, he and I, I didn't know him before he was a Christian, but he would he would often tell me uh, in conversations that before he was saved, he was pro-choice. He just felt like that was the right position. And then he said, Pat, you know, when I got saved, nobody had to convince me. Nobody had to convince me that my position was wrong. I just instantly became pro-life because he j- why? Because you're a new creation. You think differently. As a believer, the fourth witness are the scriptures. Look at verse 39. Jesus says, You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures, and here's the word, that testify about me. That testify. To testify means to provide accurate information about something that that you've seen or heard. And the scriptures testify about Jesus. Now, I want to spend just a couple minutes on on this because this is really, really key uh, for your life and for mine. Now, the Jews felt, and this again is recorded in the writings of the Mishnah, uh, where it's written, the more study of the law, the more life. If a man has gained a good name, he has gained somewhat for himself. But if he has gained for himself words of the law, he has gained for himself life in the world to come. So what that's saying, if I gain words of the law, if I learn the Torah, if I learn the word of God, that's equivalent to having eternal life. But you know, knowing the Bible doesn't mean you have eternal life. Memorizing the Bible is not synonymous with eternal life. The Bible has and contains the message of eternal life, but if you were to come over to my house and I feed you, a, feed you some food and you don't eat the food, you don't get the benefit of that food. So even if the gift is given, if you don't receive the gift, so you can read the Bible, but if you don't ask Jesus to save you, you're not saved. You don't have eternal life. Now, keep your, keep your place here in John chapter 6. We'll, we'll come back to this. Actually, let's do something else first. So... Um, let me see here. <laughs> okay, now we'll do it. We'll do it this way. All right. So uh, go with me to Luke chapter twenty-four. We'll come back to John chapter six in just a second. Uh, but Luke chapter twenty-four, fascinating, very fascinating passage of scripture. And um, if you don't have a habit of Bible reading, I hope that after today you will start the habit of Bible reading. And if you need help with that, 
give us a call and we'll help you learn how to just have a habit of Bible reading here. Uh, but this, this section right here, and this is at the end of, um, this is after the resurrection. Jesus is with his, his disciples. He's appeared to them. He's in his resurrected body. And, and it says here in verse 44, Luke chapter 24, it says, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And with that phrase there, Jesus is including the whole Old Testament there. The law, the prophets, and the writings is, is the actual Jewish uh, division of the Old Testament. But he says, everything must be fulfilled that was written about me, about Jesus. In fact, when um, Philip came to Nathaniel, uh, he said, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, talking about Jesus. And then he goes on here in, in verse 45, Luke chapter 24. Uh, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, fascinating. So when you're reading the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, look for Jesus. Look for these, look for these threads of the, there's a coming Messiah. We need a, we need a rescuer. Look for these signs of hope. It, it, it runs all the way through Scripture, and, the, and this is what Jesus' uh, point is. We're going to talk just a little bit more about that, but I want you to notice back in, in John chapter 6, I'm sorry, John chapter 5, we, Jesus has presented now all of these four witnesses. And like he's so good at, he turns the table, and, and you, you begin to realize that Jesus is really not the one on trial. The Jews are the ones on trial, because now Jesus pronounces the verdict. And that happens in verse 40, where he says, uh, in John chapter 5, verse 40, he says, you refuse to come to me to have life. It's the only place to get life, folks, is with Jesus. He says, you refuse to come to me to have life. Uh, and, then, and then verse 41, he says, I don't accept praise from men, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I have come in my Father's name, and you don't accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you'll accept him. And he, Jesus just rattles off uh, accusation after accusation, verdict after verdict. Here's his verdict. Verse 42, he says, you don't, you don't love God. You have no love for God. Verse 43, he says, you don't accept me. Verse 44, he's saying, you're seeking your own glory. Verse 45 He's saying, you, you're standing, you stand accused. Your accuser is Moses. And so Jesus pronounces this verdict upon these people that were accusing him. Now, I want to show you a couple other verses in the Old Testament that point towards Jesus. Because he said, all of this is written about me. And in... Um, in Genesis chapter 22, you don't have to turn there. We'll put these verses on the screen. Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. The context is, is Abraham. Abraham has been given this promise. Genesis 22, you should always remember, is when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. It's a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus. There's a lot of parallels there, a lot of correlation with that. But at the end of that episode... Um, uh, God says, the angel of the Lord calls to Abraham after this is over now. And he says in verse 17, I'll surely bless you, make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And then verse 18, it says, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now, who's his offspring? You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and then Judah, and then eventually that's going to be Jesus, right? So this is, is uh, although it's veiled, it's, it's um, a, a prophecy, a promise that the offspring, Jesus, 
will come, the one wrote, uh, Moses wrote about. And then uh, at the very end of the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 49, Genesis chapter 49, where now the context, this is um, Abraham's great-grandson. So you have Abraham, Isaac, I'm sorry, his grandson, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now Jacob has 12 sons. One of them is Judah. And this is uh, at the very end of his life. Jacob is blessing his sons. And he says this to Judah. Verse 10, Genesis 49 says, The scepter uh, shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. So another prophecy about the coming of Jesus. And then years later, um, in Numbers chapter 24, we have this prophecy. I see him, but not now. I perceive him, but not near. A star will come from Jacob, and a scepter will arise from Israel, he will smash the forehead of Moab and strike down all the Shethites. So you have, and those are just three verses, but you could, you could look through all the Old Testament and find how they speak of Jesus. And so when you read the Bible, know that this is, this is the story, this is the narrative that God's writing um, about this Messiah that's coming. And so now meet Jesus, the God-man, here in, in John's gospel, where we are actually seeing the fulfillment of all of this prophecy. And if you want more information about all of this, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel. On Wednesday night, I'm going through a series called God Wrote a Book. And so we look at some of these themes through, through all of the books uh, in, in the Bible. We're up to, we just finished the book of Ruth. Um, so you can, you can uh, check those out if you are interested. Well, so we talked about four witnesses. Do you remember what they are? We have the forerunner, John the Baptist. We have the works of Jesus. We have the Father. And we have Scripture. There's one more witness I want to talk to you about. And uh, hopefully you still have your place in, uh, in Luke chapter 24, um, which, which we read where Jesus opens their minds. He shows in the Old Testament how the whole Old Testament is written about him. He opens their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. Then he, he, he talks about his death, resurrection, repentance, forgiveness. I mean, this is the gospel right here. Uh, Going to be preached to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then look at verse 48. This is the fifth witness. Who is it? You are witnesses of these things. It's you. It's us. We are witnesses. We are, we are witnesses of what Jesus has done. And, uh, and so I have found that when you have these lapses of faith, when, when, you, when you feel like giving up, giving in, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, you know, when you, when you have these moments that we all have, one of the best things to do is to do something. To, to show up early on a Wednesday morning and help distribute food. You know, to go uh, minister to somebody, to call somebody and pray with them to be active, to go be a witness. Because sometimes it, we, we look within and we get so depressed. We look around and we get even more depressed. But we have to look up. We have to look at Jesus. And we'll be inspired, we'll be impressed, as I think John Corson says. And, and so, so in the moments when you're struggling, just go do something for the Lord. You know, call up the church and say, hey, I'd like to volunteer for children's ministry. Or, or I'd like to, to, to come and, and help in some way. Put feet to your faith, in other words. Just go do something for the Lord. And then you'll find that, that God will just use that in your life. You know, to encourage, not, not just to encourage you and to get you out of the, the quagmire that, that you're in. And I hope nobody's hearing condemnation here because th these are things we all go through. Uh, but we're in Christ, and the Lord brings us out of this. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you in that. Um, now, with all of this in mind, we come to the communion table. Leaving John's gospel, flip just a few pages to the right after the book of Romans, after Acts and Romans, and you'll come to uh, First and Second Corinthians. And in... Um, 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there's a section there where Paul talks about the Lord's Supper, talks about communion. And of course, Jesus, that we just saw, he was, he was talking about how I'm equal with the Father. I'm doing these miracles. I've come to save. I'm the Messiah, the Savior. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that eventually he ended up on a cross, which is how they um, killed criminals that, were, that had done something wrong, obviously that had, excuse me, that had committed an offense. Isaiah chapter 52 is very clear that God's wrath was laid upon Jesus. God judged Jesus for, not for his sin, but for our sin. Now, we're not going to confess our sin publicly here, but I'm sure if we went around, it wouldn't take any of us very long to think about something that you've done wrong. Maybe it's a thought. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's selfishness. Maybe it's hatred. Maybe it's, you know, looking at stuff you shouldn't look at, going to websites you shouldn't visit. It it could be a, a host of other things. Jesus died on the cross. And, and those things are wrong. They're vile. They're evil. And they have to be punished for righteousness sake. In other words, we, we can't get to heaven as sinful creatures. We can't have a perfect paradise with the Lord if we're corrupted to the core. Am I right? So here's the thing. Jesus died on the cross. The reason he died is, as Isaiah 52 tells us, it says he was stricken, which is an old English archaic word, but it means he was struck. He was, um, the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. Um, it says that God let me, let me read it because it's, um, it's very profound. It says in, in Isaiah, I might have said 52, I meant 53. Um, it says, he took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. We considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is holy ground. This is so profound and so deep. The fact that that I'm looking out and I, I see all of you, all of you watching online, all of your sin was laid upon Jesus. You remember, he, he hung on the cross. And, and these words, they, they are just, they're so deep. You can, you can just spend time meditating upon this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew what it was like to be forsaken by God. It wasn't a lapse of faith. It was the punishment of sin that was laid upon him. It was for your lapse of faith and my lapse of faith. What was it like for Jesus, God and very God, to have the Father turn his back so that all of the sin would be laid upon Jesus? This is profound. Did you ever realize that? Jesus knew what it was like to be separated from God so that we wouldn't have to be. And so as in just a a minute, uh, Jake and worship uh, team is going to come and you're going to have an opportunity to come up and get uh, the cracker and the juice together, the cracker on the bottom, the juice on top there, so just grab one cup. And and this is a covenant that we have with God. As 1 Corinthians... tells us the Apostle Paul wrote about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where he says in verse 23, I received from the Lord 
what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this is a covenant. If you take the, the cracker and the juice, you're saying yes to a covenant. You're saying, okay, I'm, I agree to this covenant, a promise, a relationship built on a promise of God. It's a good deal, by the way. His life for our holiness. I don't know if you think of yourself as holy, but when God sees you, he sees you without sin. I've never gotten used to that. When God sees me, he sees me as perfect. It almost sounds blasphemous to say that, but it's true because of Jesus. He loves you. He loves you, and he's here to forgive. If you've never asked him to forgive you, now's a good time. If you're here, you're watching online, or you're here in this room, and you've never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin, would you please do that right now? Um, to ask him to forgive you, all you have to do is ask him to forgive you and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I believe in you. I trust in you. This makes sense, and I don't really understand the implications of everything I'm doing, but I just want to be forgiven of my sin. And if you do that, 100% he'll say yes, because he loves you and he died on the cross for you. His blood was shed for you. He has a plan for you. So um, they're going to play a song about Jesus, and you come up and you get bread and juice. And uh, even if you're not a Christian here, if you ask him, to save you and just say a prayer either right now or as you come up and sit down or just, I mean, this is for everyone as long as you ask Jesus to save you, repent of your sin and come to the cross. Lord, your word says that a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. And so we just take a moment and we think about our own heart, our own life. And Lord, if there's anything going on in any one of us that displeases you, God, I pray you'd bring it to our mind right now. We would confess it and repent and freely receive your grace. Lord, we love you. We love you very much, Lord. And, and we are just so, so indebted to you, Lord. You deserve our entire life, Lord, and we give it to you. This bread represents his body that was broken for you. Let's all take of the bread. This is the cup of the new covenant. We have a covenant with God Almighty. Our sins forgiven. Brothers and sisters, rejoice. Your sin is forgiven. Let's all take of the juice. Let's all stand. Uh, we're going to close in a song. And if you need prayer, there'll be people available to pray for you after the service. <laughs>